Welcome to Beneath the Wing. Just like air passing over the wing of an aircraft provides lift, the people we meet can also give us lift in life by sharing their stories of strength and success, connecting us all. Beneath the Wing explores the stories of those connected with the Minnesota Air National Guard's 133rd Airlift Wing with a little humor and learning along the way. I'm your host, Wing Command Chief, Mark Legfold. Today on Beneath the Wing, we're getting the chance to meet Lieutenant Catherine Morsch. And I have to admit, I had a tough time writing your intro because there's really no way to summarize you in one encapsulating paragraph. Uh, you've had an already rich career in the military, but that isn't the essence of what makes you, you. So uh, the only word that I could really find is fascinating. So let's just start there. Do you consider yourself to be a fascinating person? No, Chief, I don't at all. In fact, when you asked me to uh, to sit with you and do this podcast, I thought, oh, there's, there's a million more, pe hundreds more people at the 133rd that I think we're probably far more fascinating than I am. Okay, so mm -hmm. do you consider everybody to be fascinating? Oh, yeah, I mean, I think everybody's got a story to tell. They do? Yeah, for sure. And, and you have one, too, so we're going get, to get into that a little bit today. Sound good? Yes, absolutely. Great. Sounds great. <laughs> um, uh, reviewing what makes you, you, there's a lot of education and a lot of training there, and really it's a, it's a fascinating story. You started in the National Guard in North Dakota. North Dakota. North, North Dakota. Dakota. Oh. What brought you to the North Dakota Air National Guard? Uh, so I, um, I did my first year of college at a technical school in South Dakota uh, as an architectural drafting major. So, um, and met somebody there, um, a friend of mine who was in, actually in the Army National Guard. Uh, and um, then, you know, decided through a few different, for a few different reasons to join the, the National Guard and Air National Guard in particular. So I was specifically looking at schools that had an architecture program because I wanted to go on and do architecture from there. And so, you know, toured, um, I think I toured NDSU and actually the U of M and I liked the NDSU um, campus. And then I also, I think while I was there, I also talked with the um, with the 119th when I when I visited them, and I think for some reason when I came down to visit the U of M, the I couldn't I either couldn't connect with the recruiting or like it just didn't line up with the time that I was here. Let me understand this: you were shopping for a college and a a place to land in the military at the same time. I think so. yeah, I remember visiting the 119th early on when I was looking at at colleges. So. And just because your friend was in the guard and. It seemed like a really awesome thing to do. The well, clothes were cool. What was yeah, it? Yeah, so um, there's a little bit more to the story about that. But so when I was in college, or my first year of school, um, I was a very, I'm, I'm a very independent person. And, um, and I can't remember exactly what happened. But at some point during that first year, there was a conversation with my family about having to kind of pay for ongoing school. Um, and I think that they proposed to me that I would have to take on some of that responsibility and, um, kind of put it, I, I think I threatened maybe isn't the right word, but like something like that, where I was like, all right, if you want me to pay for school, like I'm just going to join the military and, you know, we'll go from there. And they called my bluff and said, okay, I think that's a great idea. And I thought, oh, okay. Was that atypical for your parents to, to to be supportive of you going into the military? Oh, no, I don't think so. I mean, okay. they, so it's actually interesting about, so I've up until like the last year or so have always said like, I'm the first person in my family to be in the military. Like, you know, they, that, that's, you know, kind of wore that as like a, a, a cool thing about, you know, like I'm the first one. But recently I've actually learned that my grandpa was in the army and my grandma was in the Marines. Really? Um, and and then my my um, step grandpa he was um, he was a flight instructor on a war contract, so worked really closely with the military. But but nobody really talked about that as I was growing up. And so I thought I was like going into the military as the first one in my family, and that was this really special thing. But 
Um, but anyway, they called my bluff. We went and looked at the, so my parents went with me. We went and looked at the Army National Guard. Um, I almost, I was like, you know, gonna sign on the Army National Guard dotted line. And my dad had a friend who was in the Air Force active duty. And he said, yeah, we should probably just check out the Air National Guard. And so we went there and I think, um, you know, they kind of talked about the differences, which there are, there are many between the Army and the Air. There are many. And I recognized that I was probably a better fit for the, for the Air National Guard. And so um, then went through that process. I, I think that, of course, that started kind of in South Dakota where I was doing my mm -hmm. tech school and close to where I lived. And then, and then yeah, started working at NDSU and then... All of that, kind of all at the same time. Yeah, yeah, and it all kind of fell. Have you always place. burn the candle at both ends. Uh, yes, but I am much more. Uh, I mean, if we're talking literally, I'm much more of a morning person than I am. So you, you burn the candle early in the day, mm -hmm. and then you're burned out by the night. Yes, yeah, yes. that makes good sense to mm -hmm. me. Yeah, I'm. Uh, I'm impressed reading how much balance you've seen to maintain in your life. Um, uh, specifically, uh, the the last podcast that I did, I we talked a little bit about love in, in the in the military and family. And um, my wife and I were talking in the first part of that about work life balance and how I think what I said was I have to work at balance. How do you how do you get balance? What do you do that works to find balance? Because um, you're not just a military member. You have so much education that we'll talk about here in a little bit. But on top of that, you're a parent and a spouse. And what do you do that works to find balance? Uh, so I don't. I don't think that I have balance. I don't think. I think balance is. A, I don't know. Maybe an unachievable goal for. We're always kind of in flux, right? So some days or some hours, you know, I am doing more work stuff than I am family stuff. And some days my family takes priority and I have to focus more on that. And so I think that it's always kind of this teeter totter. Um, and, and, and that changes day by day. I think that it, I think that it's something that I absolutely a hundred percent need to constantly be working on and thinking about and, and I don't do it great all the time and you know my husband and kids will tell you that mm -hmm. and and then I drop balls at, at you know work at times too and that's because I got sick kids at home or virtual school happening or or whatever so I think that um yeah I mean I would love to say I you know that I do balance it but but I don't every day is different and, and it's a, it's a teeter-totter that's that's for sure I um there's this uh you're constantly making sacrifices in, in one way or another. Um, what's hard for you when it comes to sacrifices and what's not so hard? Yeah, so it's hard for me. Um, it's hard for me if I, <clears throat> excuse me, if I say I'm going to do something and then I don't follow through. Like that just gets me to the core. Um, or if, you know, if somebody's counting on me, deadlines, things like that, um, that's, it, on the work side, that's that's really hard for me um, to let go of those things. On the family side, um, I think, you know, I have a super supportive husband um, and kids who are just incredibly kind and resilient and, you know, coming down to drill or, um, you know, I'm leaving for tech school in a couple of months here, so kind of preparing for that. Um, I think that unfortunately right now, because of all that support at home, sometimes the family stuff, it's, it's a little bit easier to, to say, sorry, I'm going to miss this, or I'm going to be late to be home or, Hey, can you do supper for the, you know, Oh, just kidding. Every night of the week, you do supper to my husband because I'm usually running late with my hair on fire and trying to get things done at work. So, um, so right now it may be just being a little bit more in a new position, you know, trying to get to know what I'm supposed to do and um, establish myself there, that my balance for sure a little bit is more more easy right now. Um, not that it feels better, yeah. but uh, it's a little bit easier to... So what's not so hard? What's not so hard? Yeah. Um, 
like to give up or what? Uh, when it comes to the, the sacrifices that, oh. that you make in, in working to balance, um, what's not so hard? You talked about your resilient kids and your, your husband must be a good cook or yes. at least well practiced at it. He is. Yes. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think it's, I think it's all hard. I mean, I think that, um, I'm trying to think of something that's less hard. Yeah. Um, it, well, so I will say that now that we live closer to family, um, having kind of that safety net, uh, it, it, it feels, it feels a little bit safer, you know, like if I know that I'm running late and, um, and my husband has late meetings and I can't get to pick kids up, I know that, I know that there's a safety net there that I can call a grandparent. Um, we've been trying really hard with COVID to not tap into those resources, but just knowing that that exists, mm -hmm. if there's an emergency, um, that's, that's huge. Um, and I, um, I know that a lot of people don't, don't have that. Um, and we didn't when we were out in DC and before. And so it, it is nice to just have that reassurance that yeah. we have other people that can help out. For sure. Having the, the safety net of, you know, just a community structure. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's one of the things in the guard, especially that uh, when we talk about what's hard and what's not so hard, sometimes we lose sight of the, hey, it's not so hard because I have a good mm -hmm. community structure around me. Uh, whereas on the active duty side, where you have people that just, they live in a remote place. Mm -hmm. I lived in Alaska for a while. There is no family. Yeah. And suddenly that, that active duty portion, that's your family, that's your support structure, that's your community. Mm -hmm. And so that one of the things that's just not so hard is, hey, we grew up here. Yeah. Um, maybe that, not taking that for granted is one of those things that uh, it, it's, it's important in our careers. Yeah, and I'll say on the flip side of that, on my full-time and then even drill status, I feel like I've been really fortunate, I mean, even like currently, but even in the past, that I've always had um, either leaders or supervisors or somebody within that kind of chain that I can say like, hey, this is important to me. I know that this deadline is coming up. I'm not going to be able to meet it or I'm going to need a little bit more time. Um, and I think in most cases that's um, been received well, or at least they've understood and we've figured out a plan. So Yeah. yeah. And, you know, and, and I can, for the most part, I think that's pretty typical. People want to support the they, they want to support their airmen or their soldiers, which, mm -hmm. okay, so bringing this up, you work in a very soldier-centric environment right now because yeah. you just got a new job. Mm -hmm. What's what's your new job? So my new job, I am the, vic the first full-time victim advocate at the Camp Ripley Training Center up near Little Falls, Minnesota. Okay, so what does that job mean? Uh, well, so it's brand new. So for me, that's really exciting because I, I get to have a part in kind of building what that is and what that looks like for Camp Ripley. Um, but, you know, when we're talking about sexual assault, you know, I, I hope and my vision is that a large piece of my job is going to be focused on prevention. So supporting the training that happens, um, you know, doing command consults if commanders or leaders have questions about creating a, a you know a safe environment or envir an environment without sexual sexual assault. Um, so I, I hope to be doing a lot of the prevention side of the house. Um, of course, I'll also be involved with response. So when there is a sexual assault, I'll help with response. Now it is Army Training Center. And uh, I, I, I say Army Training Center, but really it's a, it's a training center. So we have people coming from the Air Force. We have people coming from the Coast Guard. We just had like a Navy dive team doing some really incredible like winter dive stuff up there. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's a lot of kind of transient um, or people visiting for different trainings. And, um, and on the Army side of the house, they all have... Um, we would maybe call them volunteer, but um, they're collateral duty victim advocates. And so my role up there is not to replace the work that they do, but to support and kind of help where I can, or um, or if you know they're uh, working to fill that position and they maybe don't have it, then I would I would help fulfill that. So when I'm talking about response, I might be the initial response, mm -hmm. um, but the hope is then I'll be able to you know do a warm handoff or transition that person 
uh, to their collateral duty veteran advocate. So line. somebody that mm -hmm. is a part of their original organization, mm -hmm. you just yeah. hand, hand them off? Yep. If they choose. Of course, it's entirely victim-driven. So yeah, Of course, mm -hmm. of course. This, this type of work in the military <clears throat> has um, evolved over the last mm -hmm. 10 years or so. And it, it's become more and more important um, when uh, the uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs says this is in our ranks and it is a problem and we're going to work to eliminate it and create a culture where it doesn't exist, where sexual assault is not a part of our ranks. Are we starting, are we getting it right or are, is there still a long way to go when it comes to sexual assault in the military? I think we're moving in the right direction, but I think we have a road ahead of us, for sure. Um, I think that, um, yeah, I, th I think we have, I think we have work to do. Until there's none. Until there's none, of course, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. still work to do with the prevention, isn't there? Yeah, because I think you know when that you know that aspirational goal of of zero, when that's there, there's ongoing, constant, everyday work that we have to do to maintain that positive culture of, you know, that that continuum of harm, you know. So mm -hmm. making sure that people aren't telling those you know inappropriate jokes or you know, and then moving across that, you know, to the unwanted touching and things like that all the way to when it gets to the, the serious um, or the most, um, like, rape on the very far end of that spectrum. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think we'll always have work to do to maintain that culture. It is a hard culture to change. Mm -hmm. um, I, I agree with you. I think we've, we've made strides, but we're not there yet. Mm -hmm. um, you have... You have worked in almost every difficult, uh, um, when it comes to those soft, caring things. You wouldn't really affix to somebody in the military that works in suicide prevention like you have, uh, like sexual assault prevention and response like you are. Uh, and you're well trained for it. You have a master's degree from St. Kate's mm -hmm. in St. social Thomas work? St. Kate's, yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, um, and I asked you, is, is what we do as a military, which is to provide for the defense of our country, um, are those types of soft skills important to getting that mission done? And if so, which I assume you're going to nod your head and say yes, uh, how, how does it fit into the over idea of, overall idea of we're militarily ready? So every single thing that we do every single day is suicide prevention and sexual assault prevention. Everything we do. The way that we talk to people, the way that we you know, walk into our office, the way that we um, conduct a commander's call, the, the language that we use, the words that we use, um, everything that we do are, is, includes those things and has an impact on those things. And, and this, so, is a, this is a big we, we. This is every single person? We, that is, yes, uh, yes. Okay. I mean, we is like the great, I, I mean, we like as the world, as, you know, the all leadership, people in our, you know, within the Air National Guard and within our community. Uh, and so I think that when we're talking about, you know, mission readiness, if we have somebody that is not, well, and this is an overused example, but, you know, like if somebody has a broken leg or, you know, needs knee surgery, um, you know, we get those kind of things fixed and taken care of. And um, I think that, you know, we need to be thinking about our um, the way that we support people when they have a, a challenge in any regard. So if it's a mental health, mental well-being um, we need to make sure that people are taken care of. And I think that when we're talking about on the sexual assault side, if we have somebody who is, you know, has been assaulted and, um, you know, maybe is still working through that process, um, we, you know, we need to support them until they are 100% mission ready or we need to adjust so we can make sure that they get the things that they need um, because, if we don't have people, we don't have a mission. I mean, that's... And if our people aren't healthy, mm -hmm. 
we can't get the mission done well. Absolutely. So taking care of them is important. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I, 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 I like the idea that, okay, we have people like you that are experts in your field at, at that. You don't have to grimace your face. That, no one can see that on a podcast, by the way. Yeah. Um, and don't be, don't be modest. Experts in your field, so well-trained, so well-qualified. Um, but you're well-trained and well-qualified and well-experienced in this stuff so that you can be a resource, not to be the only person that can. Mm -hmm. And you're absolutely right. Um, sexual assault prevention, suicide awareness and prevention, it starts with every single day, every single person. Mm -hmm. How do we get every single person to be um, conscious of their responsibility and good at it? Yeah, so I think it's, it, I think it goes back to even just like very basic training, education um, about, you know, creating meaningful connections. Uh, it, so when we're talking about suicide pre prevention, you know, the things I think about are, you know, creating meaningful connections, um, reminding people that they matter, that they're important, that we need them here. Uh, I used to do a, a briefing to the new chiefs when they came out to the ANGRC, and I would A -N -G -R -C, every a, the, the Air National, National Guard, Guard Readiness, Readiness Center. Center. Yep, when I was at NGB, so got it. Um, and inevitably, every single time, I would have a chief that would say to me, "But we only have these people here one weekend a month, maybe two weeks a year. So how am I supposed to impact their suicide? You know, suicide prevention have an impact on that." And what I would, re I would flip that and say, you get to have them two days out of the month. How do you remind them that 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 the work that they do there makes their life worth work li worth living? Like, how do you remind them that they're important, that they're valuable, and that that they have an impact on the greater mission of of your wing? Because yeah, sure, you're not seeing them the other 28 days of the month. But what they're doing those two days, give, have that be a part of what gives them meaning in their life the other 28 days. Um, and so I, I think that um, we kind of have to get out of that mindset that, we, well, we only have them two, weeks, two days out of the month. And so somebody else will take care of them or check in on them the rest of the days. But, but they're, they're our people. Mm -hmm. They're our, our family, yeah. like you said. So we need to really be focusing on, you know, connection, reinforcing that people matter, that they're important, uh, important to the mission. And that's every single job here. Like we know, we, we know that, but does everybody know that? Does the, the airman that is, you know, doing a certain task and as they're doing it, think like, well, what does this matter if it gets done? Do they know how they fit into that bigger, bigger mission? Yeah. I think that that's really important. That is a big, big part of it. And you talked, you, you said connection more than once. This mm -hmm. has been a challenging year mm -hmm. um, where a lot of our supervisors, a lot of our airmen, a lot of the people that we work with have struggled with staying connected with one another. We've done digital drills yeah. uh, where it's all on, uh, a digital interface with the video chats and and all that but one of the things that I've been so impressed with are the youngest supervisors that we have out here the staff sergeant that is my kids age and how how organically connected they are to the people that they supervise because they're so good at this technology piece mm -hmm. um, what advice do you have to keep people connected especially while we're struggling through COVID, starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel, do we switch back and suddenly we connect face to face and, and literally face to face uh, and eyeball to eyeball? Or is there a new mix to staying connected that we're going to start realizing? I think there needs to be a mix. I think that, um, so I, if anybody knows me out there, I am definitely uh, very much an extrovert. I love to be around people. I love to talk to people. I love to chat with people. Um, and so I, I appreciate that face to face and, um, and really miss that change when everything COVID happened. Um, but I think that there is so much value in, in tapping into those other resources. And when we're talking about, you know, next generation or people who just, um, appreciate that, you know, the technology and the things that we can use, it just gives us another tool to, to be connected and to, and to, uh, 
learn and know more about our people so that we can recognize those differences and changes. And it, you know, right now in COVID times, it makes it a mu much more challenging. Um, but when we're thinking about communication and, and uh, staying connected, yeah, I mean, I think use all the tools we have. And, and some people are going to gravitate towards one uh, versus another, and, and that's okay. we got to be adaptable. We do. And sometimes that takes work for somebody. And, and your, your image that you painted of when, when I got a new chief at the Air National Guard Readiness Center, uh, a chief would be somebody like me who had been in the military for uh, over, over 20 years sometimes, uh, like me, over 30 years, and been there, done that, seen it all, and everybody needs to change and adapt to me. Mm -hmm. um, did you get that aha moment when you just flipped it a little bit where they get the opportunity to see these people one weekend a month, or did they just stay in their crusty, old, cantankerous, <laughs> old person ways? I would say most most got it, um, but I, yeah, I think most most got it. I mean, of course, there were always the few where you saw their eyes roll, and like, yeah, yeah, sure, okay, lieutenant, mm -hmm. and then, you know, that's that's how that went. Ugh. But but I I mean, yeah, I've I'm going on 17 years. I'm prior enlisted. Like I also know a little bit at least about how their National Guard has has evolved yeah. and I think it just it, it takes time culture change takes a really long time it does and it's always evolving mm -hmm. uh, so going back to the readiness center mm -hmm. um, you picked up your family and you moved out to DC and you, you took this big chance um, and in your career that's that's hard to do sometimes with a family that's hard to do with someone that in the guard where we have our our social our community structure here where we're comfortable how did you get the courage to go out there to pick up and move out to dc and and do some of that hard work what was your motivator uh so i had actually i mean i hadn't been back from o, o, ots for officer not, training school. officer training school thank okay. you um for only a few months so i got back like the first part of september and that job posted, I think, like December or January. And it actually posted, um, I was outside of the, the rank. So I was, I mean, I was a brand new second lieutenant. Um, and I think it was posted as like a first lieutenant or above. And, and so I had talked with my leadership here. I had a, a ton of support here and just said, hey, I kind of want to throw my name in the hat of this. I know that I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm outside of the rank, but I had talked to um, somebody who was out at the readiness center and just said, hey, what, what happens if somebody applies and they're not within the rank? Well, they said, well, they look at it and, you know, kind of depends on what, what they need and whatever. So I said, okay, well, completed my package. Um, and yeah, so I had a ton of support here with leadership that said it would be great to, it's a great opportunity. We would be, you know, it would be unfortunate for us to for you to leave the wing, but a uh, great opportunity. My husband, we um, we actually went up to uh, where actually near where we're living now, but went up there and um, left the kids with grandparents for the day, and we just like we went on a bunch of hikes. We just kind of talked through about what what would that mean for our family? Like, what does that look like? Is it even possible? I mean, we own we're you know we had a house that we owned in. River Falls, uh, and you know, like, what do we do? Do we rent? You know, and we kind of went through all the scenarios. And by the end of that day, um, he said, "Hey, I think this is a great opportunity for you. Um, let's do." It. And my husband, like, like I said, super supportive. Like, he also really likes adventures, and we've lived kind of all over and done a bunch of wild things. And um, and so at the end of that day, we said, all right. And, and at that point, um, I had already applied and they had offered the position to me. And so then we were trying to figure out if... Decision time. Yep, if we yeah. accept it or if we say, thanks so much for the offer and we're not going to do it. And so uh, we, we took the chance and um, put our house on the market like within the next couple of weeks because it was a real quick turn once they offered mm -hmm. it. Um, I think that was in March and we were out there by May 1st. So it was a real quick turn. I've been talking with Lieutenant Catherine Morsch, and it's it's uh, the first half's been really fun. We're going to come back after this break and talk a little bit more about taking chances, so stick around. 
Hello, this is Mary Matson, the 133rd Director of Psychological Health, otherwise known as the DPH. I provide solution-focused counseling, referral to community providers, early intervention, and crisis response. My services are open to 133rd members and their dependents. Contact me to talk, ask questions, get help, or just say hi. You can contact me by calling my office at 612-713-2099 or my cell at 612-710-4477. And again, that number is 612-710-4477. Otherwise, you can find me on the Wing app. I've been talking with Lieutenant Catherine Morsch of the 133rd Airlift Wing and also from Camp Ripley up in, near Little Falls, Minnesota. Full-time job up there. That's true. Mm-hmm. Traditional job down here one week in a month. And we, and we, when we left it and went to break, we were started talking about taking chances um, and some of the chances that you've taken and the one chance that you took to go out to D.C. with your family and take a job there. And that's not the only time that you did something kind of wild and crazy in your life. You took a break from the guard, from the military, and did something that uh, seems a little odd. I wouldn't say unmilitary, but definitely on a different spectrum than where we normally fall. You took a break from uniform that's camouflaged and joined the Peace Corps. I did, Chief. Mm-hmm. Why did you do that? <laughs> My first question is, why did you do that? The next one is, tell us what that was like. Because you went someplace really, really cool and did some good work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, actually, um, the the military is actually what brought me to the Peace Corps. So at the 119th, our state partnership, so Fargo, when I was up at the Fargo, or the North Dakota Air National Guard in Fargo at the 119th, our state partnership was with Ghana. Ghana, Africa. And Mm so um, we did a humanitarian mission to Ghana and it changed my world. It was um, one of the, one of the best experiences of my life. Um, I, so I was medical admin, a prior enlisted again, so medical admin for A, and we had a few different uh, clinics um, kind of like satellite sites that we stood up while we were there. So we provided humanitarian support, or humanitarian, or it was a humanitarian mission, and we provided like medical care. And because I was admin, I um, ended up being the person that was at the front gate. And so I was, you know, basically checking every single person in. Every, and I did this all, all of the days we were there. Um, checking every single person in. So I I came in contact with every Ghanaian that came into the clinic and, um, you know, saw people who, you know, we had somebody who like walked miles and ended up having like a broken pelvis. I mean, like, I mean, just like wild things that in my, you know, I'm from small town, South Dakota. I hadn't really been a whole, you know, traveled a whole lot, um, maybe a little bit here and there, but not a whole lot. And so I had kind of a pretty sheltered um, view of the world. And so I was, um, I was, I was just really amazed by the experience and it was really eye opening. And, and I loved the being able to kind of be immersed in another culture. I mean, it was for a small amount of time, but I, because I was at the front gate, I had two Ghanaian security guards right by me. Mm-hmm. Um, and so got to just kind of talk and get to know them. And, you know, they uh, just kind of learn about their life and their experience. And even while I was there, I started thinking like, how do I, how do I do more of this? How do I do more of like, just being a, amongst another culture that I'm not familiar with? Um, and started looking into the Peace Corps or other options that might be available. Um, and so I, shortly after that kind of started my Peace Corps application and then kind of set it aside. And then, um, my husband and I kind of, we knew each other and then, then kind of reconnected and, um, this was before he was your husband, before he was my husband. Yeah. 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 And as we were walking, walking, uh, somewhere at going on a walk, um, 
I think we started talking about kind of like life goals or like things we'd like to do. And he mentioned something about like, oh, well, you know, I started my Peace Corps application and I'd like to do that someday. And I was like, huh, interesting. I have also started a, a Peace Corps application and it might be something that I'd be interested in. Um, and then, you know, the rest is history. We ended up getting married and we went, you have to be married a year before you can do the Peace Corps as a married couple. So it's not a honeymoon. It's not a, no, it was not a honeymoon. So we, we were married in 2019 and we left, left in 2020. Wow. Or I'm sorry, we were married in 2009. Are you <laughs> and, sure? Yes. Are you positive? Uh, yes. So, so we, if you were married in 2009, how long have you been married? We've been married um, 11 years. Uh, we've been married 11 years. It'll be our 12th anniversary this coming August. Okay. You're sure about that? I'm fairly certain, okay. fairly certain. But anyway, so yeah, so the, so it was really the my military experience um, that that brought me to to the Peace Corps, and that, I yeah. That mil the fact that the military brought you to the Peace Corps is is again I'll I'll just use word it's fascinating to me, mm -hmm. and yet what is not a surprise to me is is the the fact that I know that the military that the National Guard does humanitarian missions. Mm -hmm. Is that an important part of our mission? Does it make us more prepared to do the national defense role that we do? And if so, how? I think the I think in general in the military, the more that we understand the world as a whole is is better. I think that make, it makes us better. It makes us stronger. It makes us more um, yeah, I think being a global citizen is something is very important. And um, to be able to expose, you know, airmen that maybe wouldn't have the opportunity in their everyday life to, to travel and to be a part or, or learn about other cultures, I think that that state partnership or, or that kind of that global perspective can be really valuable. Does it make us a more inclusive organization? I mean, I think, I, I'd hope so, yeah. Jane, um, we, like I said, that, that, that movement from military to Peace Corps and then back to the military. Mm -hmm. When you returned from the Peace Corps, were you still in the Guard or did you have to come back and rejoin? Yeah, so I actually separated. I, again, like I've been so just fortunate in my, in all aspects of my life, but I had very supportive leadership up at the 119th. Um, they actually offered to let me stay on the books um, and, you know, just kind of go more of an inactive status or, or front load. You took a sabbatical. Yeah, but I, but I didn't do that. Okay. Um, they offered it. Um, we worked through Jade to kind of figure out what options were available, um, but it ended up that well, I just didn't know what what life was going to be like two years later, sure. and um, and so it just made more sense. And and I felt a little bit guilty about holding up a spot. You know, I'd be I'd be holding a spot. Mm -hmm. They would be hard to recruit against and and do some of those things. So in the end, I I, I decided to separate. So I completely separated from the military, and then um, and wasn't sure when I came back if I would rejoin. I mean, we were living down down here. Um, closer to the 133rd, but the 119th was was my was my first home. Yep. Yep. Uh, and so thinking about, oh, I don't do I want to drive all? It didn't even occur to me to join the 133rd. It was, do I really want to drive all the way back to the 119th? Yeah. Uh, and then uh, we there have been some uh, people, other people from the 119th who have come down to the 133rd, good friends of mine, and um, I had a, a pretty good former 119th person that recruited me, started talking to me about coming back in. So Back in here? Back, yeah, coming to the 133rd. I'm not going to ask you which organization had a better family feel. They're probably both really good. Very different. Yeah. They're, they're very different. Different very missions. Di yeah, different yeah. missions, but different um, different environments too. I mean, at the 119th, uh, the, there's, I love Fargo, so I love Fargo. Um, but I don't know if I've ever had anybody on the podcast that says I love Fargo. So oh, there's okay. a first. There, all right. <laughs> um, but I, so I love Fargo, but there's just um, different things to do in the local area. Sure. Yeah. And so that creates a different environment for the guards 
you know, for drill status, right? So yeah. most people are kind of hanging out or staying close or, you know, um, spending maybe some outside of drill time together. Down here, we have countless things to do outside of, of drill time. Mm-hmm. And so I think that down here, people just have to be more intentional about getting those groups of, you know, our, your groups of people together to, to kind of have that after drill time to really make those connections and get to know people so that you can, um, yeah, be, have kind of that family environment. So I think it's just, it's just different environments that create different cultures. Well, we're glad you uh, ended up here at the 133rd. Mm-hmm. I'm very biased because I've been here forever, almost forever. And it, it's, I love the family out here. Mm-hmm. I really do. But I know that every guard unit out there says, I love the family out here. Yeah. And it's always, like you said, Different missions, different environment, but it, it always seems to be a family. Yeah. Well, uh, and I said that's that was my first home, and this is my home now. Yeah. You know, so it's a great way of putting it. Yeah. Um, so our home keeps changing. We're part of the military, and the, and the Air Force is uh, a, a big part of that. And we've just changed one one of the aspects of what it makes us airmen, and that's our dress and personal appearance. I asked you about, are we, you know, have we become better at becoming an inclusive organization because of the traveling and the way we do things? Um, you got the ponytail going. I do, Chief. Yep. Um, and that was something that got started to make us a more inclusive organization. Mm-hmm. So a big part of that was our new uh, Chief of Staff, General Brown, who I got a chance to at least get a picture with when I was mm-hmm. out in D.C. most recently. But... Um, I was thinking about this, and okay, I know that you're not a big drinker. He probably isn't either, but I, I can kind of picture the two of you sitting and having a very deep philosophical conversation, probably over a, a good cup of tea, maybe a thick coffee. And um, he'd probably give you a good quote, like the decision to change our, our dress and personal appearance is a commitment to supporting the airmen that we need and sustaining the culture and environment of excellence that we continue to use to make the Air Force an attractive career choice for airmen and families. So if you had his ear and you were sitting there drinking tea and he said something very deep like that, what would you tell him needed to be the next thing that the Air Force did to become a more inclusive culture? Okay, Chief, let's see. Um, the next, the next thing, I think this is, this is a, this is a big question, right? There's, there's only so much that, I mean, I think that leaders at that level, they want to do as much as they can, right? To have the biggest impact on the, on the force. Yeah. When he says Um, attractive career choice for airmen and families, that's pretty big because it recognizes the fact that people are working to balance, Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Yeah. And I think that, so I'll just speak from my own kind of personal experience. I think that we really need to, um, I, I think we really need to, figure out a way to support new families, mothers and fathers. Mm-hmm. Um, I think, and that means a lot of different things. So this is a hard question. It is. Me. They they wrestle with this stuff there. and Yeah. Well, first of all, so I'll go back actually to the hair change. Yeah. I think that there's still, um, I, I think there's still um, things that need to be addressed within that. And, um, and so I think that, you know, just because we've made some, uh, positive, you know, progression in that, I think that there's still room for improvement. So I think that even as we kind of hit these milestones and we're kind of moving in the right direction, we can't just say, okay, we did the hair thing. Now we're going to move on to the next thing. Yeah. Um, and so, so there's still that. I think that, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I don't know. And, and even with supporting, you know, new families, I think that um, we've also come a long way with that. When I, you know, even things with on the base, uh, on the base here, I was so excited when I came back and I saw that the changing stations and the bathrooms were put up. That was like something, you know, two and a half years ago Mm -hmm. that I kind of got my hands in a little bit. And, you know, some of those things, nursing rooms for new mothers, like these are all things that we've 
um, that we've started to that we've started to do and put into policy, right? That's important. It's one thing to have, you know, really passionate people at the wing level that think, oh, this is kind of a good idea. It's mm-hmm. another thing to put some of these these initiatives into into policy that can really really support um, new families. But um, yeah, I don't know. Seventy-eight percent of the people in the military right now were hoping you would say beards for guys. Oh, I know, but here, yeah, yeah. I mean, okay, sure. I think you know what, beards for guys. Let's do it. But I, and I'm sure that you know this, Chief. But for for those that are listening, for the hair regulation to change for females, it was not like an overnight thing. It was years and years of research for the women's initiative team. So. Mm-hmm. Those out in the virtual world, if you're not familiar with that, it's a it's a group of of amazing men and women. Um, but they had done a ton of research, like they they did the work to get this changed. Yeah. And um, and and some of those you know higher up leaders within that team have offered to help men do the same kind of research sure. and work um, to change policy when it comes to. Um, come to be- comes to you know beards for men. So yeah. I think that yeah, absolutely, sure. I'm all I'm all for it if we can do it you know safely and if there's that you know the need um, desire to do the work. Yep, it, and it, you're right. It's a lot of work, and um, I am a fan of making a service to the country inclusive for mm-hmm. as many people as are willing to serve the country for the right reasons. Yeah. The fact that we had, I, I lost a lot of my hair very, I've lost my hair, um, probably because of the stress of life or genetics, um, but we had women that were losing their hair because they had to wear it a certain mm-hmm. way and then put a hat on or a helmet on, and um, it just was not, uh, it was not comfortable. Mm-hmm. It was not good for the the service, and I think it, it's a positive good change mm-hmm. um, that increased our readiness. Uh and so it, I was really glad to see it. And then I started reading some of the comments on the, you know, the old, crusty old chief that you would work with at the Guard Bureau that said, we, we never, this is, this change is bad mm-hmm. for the fact that it's just changed. And I just I struggled with that because, you know, I, I don't want to see somebody in pain because they just chose to serve the country. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Change is hard, regardless. Of course it is. And, and it's, you know, I've, I've had a few people say, like, it's it's kind of distracting. It's kind of, now you you see this point, you know, but because it's change, right? Mm-hmm. Anytime something changes, if you went, you know, you painted a wall, people are going to notice that, and it's going to be something different. Yep. And it just takes time to get used to it. Okay. Well, let's, let's do some rapid-fire questions, and thankfully... Okay, you had the look of relief, like, oh, no no more hard questions. Um, thankfully, you've li- actually listened to the podcast before, so you kind of know how this works. I just ask you a, a quick question that you haven't seen before, and whatever pops into your head is the right answer. But you got to say it out loud. Okay. What's your 2021 New Year's resolution? Drink more water. What's your favorite Disney movie? Uh, we have movie night every Friday and Saturday night, so uh-huh. I feel like I've—I don't—I've seen so many move, kid movies. Um, I really like Moana. Oh, I do too. That one's a good one. Yeah. Uh, last book that you read? <laughs> last book that I read? Um, Little Blue Truck to my son, Perfect. probably. Yep. Yeah. Why'd the chicken cross the road? Um, to get to the other side. That's, that's a fair answer. Uh, favorite TV show? Um, let's see. Right now, we are watching Binging is usually how it goes. We don't have TV, so it's whatever we can stream. Um, I'm not very good at this rapid fire. I want to give an explanation you're, you're for You're doing every... terrific. You're doing yeah. terrific. But um, actually, you're not following the rules. <laughs> Um, we, uh, let's see, we, we don't watch a lot of TV. I don't know. That's a tough one. But um, you're binging one right now. We're binging one right now. And, um, I think it's called Justified. Okay. Yeah. Fair. Yeah. All right. Um, you 
you drinking more water? You, you, get, you got it right there. I'm trying good. to. Most people give up on those New Year's resolutions, so good for you. <laughs> that, one, that one's a good one. Um, you are, uh, one of the other things that makes you fascinating is you're, you're a big person that cares about our environment. Passionate recycler, right? <laughs> yes. Uh, <clears throat> have you always been a tree hugger? Have I always been a tree hugger? Yep. Um, so I think that, um, no, I haven't. Nope. I don't think so. Um, I had a friend in high school who she would always, I mean, she'd like stop pull over and like pick up trash on the side. And I'd think yeah. like, all right, seriously, girl, like that's just whatever. Thank you for doing that. But it wasn't really, um, in my, my, just, I didn't think about it. Um, my husband has been a really big influence. So, um, you know, he cares about the environment and I care about him. I also care about the environment. Mm -hmm. um, but I learned a lot. I mean, he just taught me a lot about, you know, the, Im the, the impacts that we have in the little things that we do. And I think, you know, especially now um, having kids, like really thinking about like what I'm doing today is going to influence the, the world that they live in. And that's a lot of things with mm -hmm. the environment, but that's a lot of things. It's going to influence the world that they live in. And I want my kids to live in a healthy world. I mean, you know, environment and otherwise. So, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I... Haven't I, always been, but you are now. Yeah, I mean, I think I've, al I mean, I've always cared and like I don't like styrofoam and um, the, a, a former um, wing command chief, I used to give him a hard time about drinking bottled water and if he's listening, he'll know who he is. Uh-huh, yeah. Yeah. Yep. That's right. I always drink mine out of a mason jar, not because it tastes better out of a mason jar, but it lets people guess. Yep. What's he drinking today? <laughs> <laughs> um, one last question. Okay. Okay. Um, you've had a lot of role models. You've met a lot of interesting people in your life. There's a lot of people that have uh, influenced who you are and made you more fascinating and a fascinating member of our wing out here. Um, what advice from all of those people, the expertise that they've poured into you and that you've willingly taken, what advice would you share with others that has been shared with you? Um, advice that I've gotten... Hmm. I, that so as I've said, Chief, like I've been just so fortunate to have so many amazing people in my life. Like it's it's really hard to you know I'm I'm thinking you know specifically about you know certain leaders and certain supervisors and friends and peers that um, that have been so influential to me. But it's it's hard to narrow it down to one one piece of advice. I've just been. I've, I've been super lucky. I mean, and that's, that's, that's the honest truth. I've sometimes been in the right place at the right time or with the right, you know, squadron at the right time when that leader was there or, um, yeah, I, um, I think, yeah, just, gosh, I don't know. I'm going to, I'm going to share what I'd learned from you today. Okay. And it, it came out in your tree hugging answer, but it also came out in um, your response when we were talking about sexual assault prevention and suicide prevention, and that is, you know, everybody can make a difference every day mm -hmm. in, in where they're at, mm -hmm. um, and um, you don't have to be the expert in it to do it. Yeah. It just takes maybe burning the candle at both ends but or just lighting it to start. Yeah. Yeah. And I think what I've maybe learned from all of these amazing people that have been in my life is that it maybe is less about the words or the advice that you're giving and more about the actions and the way that you're treating people. Um, and maybe that's hard. For, that's why it's hard for me to like think of a piece of advice, but it's more the, um, yeah, it's more about the, the work that you do and the actions that you do and, and what that legacy is going to be, you know, be it for the wing or for the, your community or for your family. Yeah. yeah. Lieutenant Catherine Morsch. Thanks for joining me on Beneath the Wing today. This has been 
a pleasure. I'm going to let you uh, finish your water. Maybe stop <laughs> stop sweating in the hot seat today. <laughs> Thank this, you. This has been really great. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, I would like to take a second just to thank Amy Lovegren for her production expertise on Beneath the Wings, Senior Airman Maya Mikesell for her wrangling of creative expertise in questions uh, that I get to ask my guests, uh, especially Mary Matson, who threw one in there about referring to you as a tree hugger. So thanks to the people that have given us some good questions today to discuss. And I'd like to invite everybody to join me next time on Beneath the Wing, where we continue to learn about the people in our community. So thanks again for joining me today.